Well, today we are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, and we're in the middle of our series called Upside Down. We'll be on page uh, 962 in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have a Bible for you right underneath the chair of the person in front of you. Now, don't lean over and take the Bible of the person in front of you. Reach under and take the Bible of the person in front of you. We, we want you to have that Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please take it. It's yours. Keep it. If somebody tries to stop you with it, hit them in the head and leave. Uh, we're glad that you're here as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we are looking at the words of Jesus that he taught that were really revolutionary. Uh, the Jews were not expecting these words. Jesus' disciples were not expecting these words. In fact, these words, if even applied to our lives, threaten to turn our lives upside down and change us forever. Today, we are going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, and we're going to look at the difficult passage of Scripture on marriage and divorce. I want you to imagine with me two young lovers, a boy and a girl. They fall in love. They, they're preparing for marriage. Both of them are followers of Jesus. And, and throughout their engagement period, throughout their dating period, uh, throughout the nights of movies and car rides and eating out, they have successfully abstained from uh, sex uh, and they're, they're saving themselves for their wedding date. They have the date on the calendar. They follow Jesus. They want God to be honored in their marriage. And they know that if they honor God in their, uh, in their engagement period, God is going to uh, bless and honor their marriage as well. She is longing for that wedding day. She tries to find the perfect dress, the perfect location, the perfect music, the perfect flowers, the ceremony. Now, he is not dreaming about her dress. He's dreaming about taking her dress off. Uh, he's not dreaming about the ceremony. He's not dreaming about the songs. Guys, you know exactly what he's thinking about. He is ready for sex. When he says, I do, he means let's get busy. That's what a guy means. That's what they mean in their, as they're uh, uh, saying I do, because that's, what a, that's how a guy is wired. Uh, the guy is certainly wired a whole lot different. So the bride, she is convinced that she is marrying Prince Charming, that he was always going to be romantic. He will always rescue her. He will always cherish her. He will always reach down and take her tender hand and caress her shoulders and hold her close and protect her from the harshness of the world. The groom, he is convinced that he is marrying an insatiable, lust-filled call girl who is passionate about having sex any time, day or night. Now, that's what a guy thinks. A, a guy walks into a marriage thinking that he, he's just marrying a woman that is going to throw herself on him all the time. And she's thinking he is the perfect gentleman. It doesn't take too long before each realizes she realizes he is no Prince Charming and he realizes he couldn't have been more wrong about her sexual appetite. Then the arguments begin. The bickering back and forth begins. They, they hurl hurtful words at one another and they cut one another to the core. And then being the followers of Jesus that they are, he begins to quote to her, Proverbs 21, 9, better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. And she, being the follower of Jesus that she is, quotes right back to him, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. When are you going to grow up? And after a short period of time, they both begin to think, I have made a mistake marriage is not supposed to be this hard. After getting counsel from friends and family, they decide to end their marriage before it really even had a chance to get started. They both feel shell-shocked and numb. They can't put a finger on exactly what went wrong, but they know that their dreams about marriage have totally been crushed. Now, what I'd like for you to do is, is raise your hand 
if you have a family member that experienced a similar situation to that. Okay, now raise your hand if you personally have experienced a similar situation. As we walk through this sermon series and we hit this topic uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, I really believe that as we look at Matthew 5, 31 and 32, it has the ability to change us. Maybe you will value marriage much more. Maybe you'll see marriage in in the way that God desires you to see marriage. Maybe you will begin to hate the idea of divorce and that it just will simply not not resonate in your heart at all. You won't like the sound of the word divorce. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said these words. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, before we talk about this passage of Scripture, let's remind ourselves about the origin of marriage, that God is the one who created marriage. It was God's idea for one man to marry one woman till death do they part. And after God had created Adam in the Garden of Eden, he he declared that it was not good for him to be alone, and he, God, would make Adam a wife. Adam was made from the dirt, but Eve was made from one of the bones in Adam's rib cage. In Genesis 2, through 24, we see this account. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now, do you see the end result in that passage of scripture of God's plan for marriage? Do you see the last phrase? The reason why a man leaves his father and mother is so that the two, the man and woman, will become one. Oneness is God's plan for marriage. There is nothing, that means there is nothing in his life that is off limits to her, and there is nothing in her life that is off limits to him. So here, here's what that looks like in mine and my wife's marriage. At, at any point in my life, my wife is able to pick up my phone, look through my text messages, calendar, emails, Facebook friends, Facebook messages, browser history trail. There is nothing in my life that is off limits to my wife. And the same is, can be true for her. Uh, she, has absolute, uh, she has given me absolute permission to go through her phone if I would like, to read through her email, to look at her Facebook messages. We, we don't keep secrets from one another. So that, that's, that's what oneness is. See, when there is oneness, there's nothing hidden. When there is oneness, there is a togetherness. The two shall become one. The goal of marriage of a man and a woman coming together is always oneness to becoming one. And it's because of this idea of oneness that we see what Jesus teaches, and it's your first note there, that in most cases, divorce is a sin. Why? It's a sin to separate back into two because the goal of marriage was oneness. Now, I'm going to give you three exceptions. Two are biblical, and one I think is common sense biblical. Uh, The first exception when divorce is not described as a sin is by Paul as he discusses marriage and divorce in a letter he wrote to the Corinthian believers. About divorce, he wrote, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, If the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. So we can see that the first exception where divorce is not considered a sin is abandonment. It's when a non-believing spouse deserts his believing spouse. 
So that's, that's number one, abandonment. The second exception is found in Matthew 5, 32. It's right there in the words that Jesus taught that we just looked at, sexual immorality. You say, well, what is exactly sexual immorality? Well, sexual immorality is exactly that. It includes all sexual sins, adultery, affairs, pornography addictions, and especially if a, if a, if a spouse is sexually abusing their children or, your, or, or any minors. That all falls under the category of sexually immoral. It, it would be sexually immoral for a mom or a dad to sexually abuse their children. And so that spouse, when they find out, it is okay for them to divorce their spouse to protect their child because their spouse has committed sexual immorality. And the final one that I mentioned was common sense biblical is physical abuse. Now, there's no place in Scripture that permits divorce in areas of physical abuse. So why did I put it here? If we look at the end of 1 Corinthians 7.15, we'll see that the reason a spouse can divorce if they've been abandoned is because God has called you to live in peace. Now, if your spouse is physically abusing you or your children, you do not have peace. I watched my dad grab my mom and swing her around our living room by the hair of her head in a drunken rage. If you remain in a marriage where physical abuse occurs, you are perpetuating a cycle of violence that your children will begin to accept as normal. You see, I thought all the drunkenness and all the abuse and everything that was happening in my family... I thought that was normal. I thought it was functional. And I didn't realize how broken and how damaging it was until years, years later after I became a follower of Jesus. So if you're caught up in that, if you're wrapped up in some form of physical violence at your home, get out, call the police, press charges, take photographs, have proof. Now, now let me add before you get the sense that I'm kind of excusing divorce. I, I want to add a massive caveat to all three of these exceptions. Reconciliation in all three of these instances is always preferred. A, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You and I are saved by grace. God is able to redeem any marriage. God is able to redeem any past. God is able to give a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance anytime he wants. He is able to redeem difficult journeys. He is able to redeem adultery. He is able to redeem abuse. He is able to do that. And so I would say this, reconciliation is always preferred. Divorce is a last resort. So, so how, do we, how do we get there? How do you work hard to win the trust back? How do you work hard to win the heart of your spouse back again? Well, I can't guarantee that it can happen in your marriage, but I can guarantee you that God does hate divorce and God does desire reconciliation. And if both spouses desire reconciliation, if both spouses desire healing, man, then God is certainly willing to do that. The question is, are, are you willing to work toward it? Because it's going to be a long journey. Chris Stapleton really captured the voice of a marriage in need of reconciliation in his song, Either Way. Some of the lyrics to the song go like this. I'm not going to sing it. Some of the lyrics in the song say this about marriage, a husband and wife. We pass in the hall on our way to separate rooms. The only time we'll ever talk is when the monthly bills are due. We go to work. We go to church. We fake a perfect life. I pass the point a give a darn. All my tears are cried. We can just go on like this or say the word, we'll call it quits. Baby, you can go or you can stay but I won't love you either way. I used to cry and stay up nights and wonder what went wrong. It's been hard, but hearts can only do that for so long. 
Now, the reason why I like this song, I'm kind of a poet at heart. I love the emotional aspect of this song. I love how he really captures the brokenness. And I feel like there are a lot of marriages that when this song was on the radio and when it was written and as it was played, they related to this. They feel like they don't talk anymore emotionally with their spouse. They feel disconnected from their spouse. And frankly, they relate to the attitude is, I don't care if we divorce. I don't care if we stay married. I'm not going to love this person anyway. If you can relate to the emptiness in that song in regard to your marriage, understand you do not have to settle for the solution that he suggests. Either divorce or stay in a marriage that's unhappy. You don't have to settle for that. As a follower of Jesus, you have the power of the living God within you. You are born again. You are made new. There is more to you than life in life than just settling for mediocre in your marriage. See, if you are struggling with a mediocre marriage, if you struggle with those thoughts and temptations of divorce, understand you do not have to settle for that. No, God wants something better for your marriage than you could ever possibly imagine. God wants to reunite the heart of you and your spouse. God wants to reconcile the heart of you and your spouse. And oftentimes it's because of our own stubborn nature, we won't let God work. I want to encourage you, don't settle for the mediocre. Settle for something fantastic. Settle for something that God has wired you and created you for. Settle for joy. Settle for hope. Settle for a renewed love with your spouse. I can say that because the story I opened up with about the young bride and the young groom could have been mine and Christy's story. Our first two years of marriage were, were terribly difficult. In fact, she would agree and with me, they, it felt like hell. I was a youth pastor. She was a youth pastor's wife. On the outside, we looked fine. We went on mission trips. We led Bible studies together. Uh, we, uh, we went to church. We attended church. We were at every event that our church put on, and I was preaching from the pulpit and speaking to our youth on Wednesday nights. But behind the scenes, oh, man, we bickered. We argued. We hurled mean words at one another. She would call me an idiot. And under my breath, I would call her a name that wasn't appropriate. We were successful at hurting each other. And, and I would read Ephesians 5, right? I was, that, I was that hungry guy growing spiritually, right? Reading my Bible, Ephesians 5. And, and I was so upset. I would read where Paul wrote, Wives, submit to your husbands. And I couldn't figure out why my wife would not let me lead. When we were on a youth trip, when, we, when I would have to make a decision in front of the students, uh, I would make a decision and she would second guess it. While I was trying to lead, I felt like she was pulling the rug out from underneath my feet. And I just couldn't figure out what was wrong with my wife. After all, Ephesians 5, 23 and 24 could not be any more clear. It said, for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. It, Ephesians could not have been more clear. I could not have been more right. Christy was not submitting to me. Christy was not letting me lead. And after a couple of years of this, I couldn't ignore the nagging voice that was growing louder and louder in my head that, Joe, you married the wrong person, that somehow I made a mistake and that she really didn't love Jesus enough. And then God showed me that I was so focused on Christie's role that I had failed 100% at understanding my role. I failed 100% 100 at understanding the role that God had for me in Ephesians 5. First, in that Ephesians 5 passage, I had missed completely Ephesians 5.21 
where Paul wrote, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now in that passage, Paul wasn't yet speaking to husbands and wives, but he had just spoken about every relationship imaginable. And he was saying, hey, as followers of Jesus, submit to one another. Have that mutual submission, that mutual oneness. He taught that throughout scripture that followers of Jesus ought to always practice mutual submission. That we always set aside our own selfish desires and selfish ambitions and live to serve other people. So secondly, I had missed Ephesians 5.25 that spoke specifically about my role. For husbands, Paul wrote, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Now, if you have a Bible, and and you currently do, if you've never had a Bible before, you got one now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Ephesians 5.25, and I want you to circle those words, He gave up His life for her. See, God showed me that His desire is not for me to lead, but to give up my life for my wife. Husbands and wives, your marriage is not doomed to fail. It takes both of you working hard, but if one of you will die to yourself, if one of you will die to your selfish ambitions, if one of you will begin to allow God to change you, God is going to bring reconciliation and God is going to bring peace to your marriage. So I want you to understand that you can prevent divorce by prioritizing oneness see god's design in marriage once again is that two people two sinful two selfish two unrighteous ungodly people will become one and i can tell you that is what doesn't make any sense marriage is an incredible mystery to me you take you take two people typically young people uh, who uh, just out of college or maybe during college or maybe they haven't gone to college yet. You take two people and you put them in a one-bedroom apartment and say, okay, you're now one. It, It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. And that is a great mystery. And it's so powerful of God's, and it's so demonstrative of God's design for marriage. You take two people, they lead their parents, they come together, and they form one flesh. Oneness is the goal in every marriage. Every marriage, oneness is the goal. Uh, Submitting to your husband and giving your life up for your wife is submission to Oneness. Now, if you have a hard time thinking about a wife submitting to her spouse or a, or a husband submitting to his wife, just think of it in terms of the context. Hey, is I'm going to give myself to oneness. I, I want us to be one. See, it, it took me those first two years to learn that I was not the chief tiebreaker in my family. Right? I mean, I just thought I was. That's what I thought my wife submitting to me meant. See, I thought that if she wanted to do this, if she wanted to do A, and I wanted to do B, then as chief tiebreaker, I did B, or we do B. And then she's dragging her feet, and she doesn't like what we decided to do. And I thought, man, her heart's just not right. See, the role of the husband is not to be the chief tiebreaker. The role of the husband is to give up his life for his wife. Now, I'm not going to camp out on the wife section at all. I know better than that. I spent two years camping out on the wife section and not being able to figure out why my wife wouldn't listen. So I'm speaking directly to the men. If you are living for yourself, if you have your own recliner, if your kids aren't allowed in your bathroom, if you have your own places in your house that are off limits to everybody, my opinion is, You don't understand what it means to give up your life for your spouse. You don't understand what it means to to lead. See, there are no places that are off limits. 
If you want to experience oneness, you have to give up your selfishness. You have to leave it be. So now Christy and I will be married this December for 20 years. Uh, two years longer than my parents made it. Uh, after 17, it's 17 years after I was ready to throw in the towel. So how have we prioritized oneness? Let me tell you, first off is we prioritized prayer. See, if I'm not growing in my relationship with God, I cannot grow in oneness with my wife. I'll even have seasons where I'm not growing in my relationship with God and I'm not connecting with my wife at all. I'm not connecting with my kids at all. I need the presence of God in my life so that I can grow in oneness with my wife and relate better to my children. The more you pray for your wife and for your marriage, the more intimacy will increase as well. Guys, your wife thinks it's sexy when you get down on your knees and you grab her hand and you pray for her. She likes that. It's romantic, especially if she's a follower of Jesus. Man, she just thinks that you, you're awesome. And we all want intimacy to increase. Secondly, we prioritized listening. Now when Christy is speaking to me, I always strive to stop. I'm not perfect at this, okay, right? Because I'm a guy and I'm stupid and I'm dumb and I would say dumb things and don't always do what I want to do. But I always strive to stop what I'm doing when Christy is speaking to me, establish eye contact, and listen to her. Now, not in a patronizing way, not in a way like, you know, yes, dear but in a more way that's, you know, very real, where I, I just stop and I listen to her. I, I give her feedback if she's looking for it, and I don't offer solutions unless she asks. It's not my role to try to solve her problem. I just need to listen to her. If you increase listening, guys, you will find that intimacy increases as well. Third, prioritize serving. You know that, that crap in your house that your spouse hates doing? You know, start there. You're like, well, you know, I, I help out around the house. Do what she hates doing. If there are things that she hates and, and, and wives, if there are things that your husband hate, hates to do, but you don't really mind it, then do it for one another. Start there. If he hates scrubbing the toilet, do it before, she, uh, do it before he has to. If she hates removing the hair from the clogged drains, do it before she has to do it. If she's doing the dishes, jump in and sweep the floor. If he's cooking dinner, set the table. Serve one another. In fact, try to outserve each other and enjoy serving while you're doing typical chores around the house. Have fun. And that really takes us into that, that final point is do something fun together laugh together uh do do fun stuff uh keep dating your spouse I, I love throwing frisbee with my wife i guarantee you nobody in this room can throw a frisbee like my wife and that is an absolute truth nobody can catch a frisbee like my wife i love watching my wife run down those frisbees grab them we throw we have fun we laugh last weekend we went down to rotary park uh, we went to the field we were throwing frisbees together as a family and it was awesome Make marriage the very best that you can. Work hard together and work hard at having fun together. Invite God into your marriage. God desires that you laugh and enjoy the wife of your youth while you are young. So guys, make the best of this. Ladies, make the best of this. God has brought you together until death do you part. Don't allow the world to determine whether or not you can have a successful marriage. Now, let me speak uh, just kind of clearly to those of you here who are not yet a follower of Jesus. Maybe your marriage is on the ropes because you've never committed your life to following Jesus. You, you can't follow God because you're, you, you, can't, you can't honor your wife in marriage because you're not a follower of Jesus. I, I want to encourage you and I want you to believe me with what I'm telling you. I know what dysfunction is like. I know the hurt and pain caused by sin. And Jesus rescued me from that. I surrendered my life to him when I was 18 years old. And years later, when I was 26 and 27 and 28, I was still wrestling with this idea of marriage and how to get it right. I can't imagine 
me who had Christ in my heart and in my life, I can't imagine what it's like for you. I want you to know God loves you regardless of the mistakes that you've made, regardless of the past, regardless of sin. God loves you. And if you would commit to follow Jesus, I guarantee you, you will see a change occur in your marriage. So let's close out and have a word of prayer together. Father, we want to say thank you for loving us. Thank you that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our selfishness, in the midst sometimes of our hate-filled selves, Lord, you are working. And you are able to turn the heart of a sinner towards you. You're able to turn the heart of a liar towards you. You are able to turn the heart of an adulterer to you. Lord, you are able to turn the heart of somebody who has given up on their marriage completely. You are able to turn their heart to you. Father, we want to pray a blessing over all the marriages that are represented here this morning. God, we ask that you would bless them. God, that you would restore them. Father, that you would create healthy relationships between husbands and wives. And Father, we want to see you work in all of our hearts. So Lord, change us. Help us to follow you completely. And Lord, for the man or for the woman in here that has not yet become a follower of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you would draw them to you. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.